Hey, hello and welcome everyone to the final event. Our Sakab Sabancı Center for Turkish Studies is organizing this academic year. My name is Tunç Şen. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of History uh, and also uh, the deputy director of the Sakab Sabancı Center here at Columbia University. Um, each year, Sakab Sabancı Center supports our Columbia students in their critical stages of their uh, research projects. And this year, uh, we are lucky to have two dissertation fellows, uh, Deborah Sokolowski and Joshua Donovan, who will present their exciting research with us in a minute. Uh, before introducing our presenters, let me express our gratitude to Sakab Sabancı family for their tremendous support um, to promote Turkish studies related events and scholarship produced here at Columbia University. I also would like to thank Ararat Shekharian for his uh, technical support for organizing uh, today's event. Um, so let me say a few things about the format. Each fellow will present their work for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then we will open the floor for um, Q&A. So if you have any questions to any of our presenters today, please raise your uh, real or virtual hands uh, so that I will give the floor to you to address your question. Or alternatively, you can also post your question on, in the Q&A box. Uh, so our first presenter today is Deborah Sokolowski, who is a PhD candidate in the Classical Studies graduate program at Columbia University, and she is a cultural historian of the Roman Empire. Her research focuses on rural communities in ancient Bithynia, a province of the Roman Empire located in northwestern Turkey. With the support of a Sakab Sabancı dissertation fellowship, Deborah has completed her dissertation entitled Inventing Roman Bithynia, Rural Cultures and Identities in the 1st to 3rd Centuries CE, which considers how Bithynian country dwellers preserved many indigenous and rural customs while also adopting and adapting some Roman ones. Since the majority of Bithynia's population lived in rural areas, the project seeks to integrate their voices into Bithynian historiography, which traditionally focuses on urban elites and city centers. In addition to the, this generous funding from the Sakab Sabancı Center, Deborah's dissertation research has also been supported by the American Research Institute in Turkey, um, that let Deborah spend five months conducting field research in 2021 in Turkey. And before coming to Colombia, Deborah earned a BA in classics at the College of the Holy Cross. Our second presenter uh, is Joshua Donovan, who is an interdisciplinary historian of the modern Middle East and a PhD candidate in Columbia University's Department of History. His research centers on the intellectual, social, and political histories of identity in the Eastern Mediterranean and its broader diaspora. In June, Joshua will defend his dissertation entitled Imagining Antioch, Sectarianism, Nationalism, and Migration in Greek Orthodox Biladisham from 1860 to 1958. In this dissertation, Joshua examines competing conceptions of identity and subjectivity within the Antiochian Greek Orthodox Christian community of greater Syria and its diaspora during the late Ottoman period, the French mandate and the early years of the Cold War. So congratulations in advance for completing your dissertations and we are very much looking forward to hearing what you're gonna to present today. So Deborah, the floor is all yours. Great, okay, can everyone hear me okay? Um, thank you so much, Professor Shen, for the introduction um, and for taking the time to be with us today. Um, my talk today, let me share my screen. Okay. Well, let me make sure everyone can see this. Here we go. All good. Great. So my talk today is entitled Agriculture in the Afterlife, Tombstones as Cultural History in Roman Bithynia, um, which is an excerpt from my dissertation project, which I am distributing to my dissertation committee tomorrow, actually, 
Um, so on that note, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Sabanja Center for Turkish Studies at Columbia uh, for generously funding my research in this final stage of writing, um, as it's allowed me to bring my dissertation to completion literally today. Um, the Sabanja Center also generously um, allowed me funding during the summer of 2020 when the uncertainty surrounding the global pandemic made it impossible for a while to travel to Turkey. And with their support, I was able to purchase several important monographs to temporarily, as it were, bring Turkey to me for the time being. So without further ado, let me share a little bit of my work. The countryside of the Roman Empire has long been considered a paradox. A view well reflected in this excerpt from Robert Wichard's 2009 article in the Wiley Companion to Ancient History. So what Wichard says is, quote, the ancient countryside is a paradox. Rural life was rarely represented in art and literature. Yet every aspect of ancient, the ancient world was dependent upon the control and exploitation of rural landscapes. In effect, the very basis of society was systemically repressed in self-representation. Now, this view is not without reason. Indeed, the countryside was considered a paradox even in antiquity. Although the majority of the, Rome, the Roman Empire's population lived and labored in rural spaces, Country, dweller, country dwellers seldom appear in works of elite arts and literature often studied by classicists and ancient historians today. Across Latin literature, Rome's rural communities were often represented as pious farmers who humbly tended to their fields and their pastures, working hard to sustain themselves and their families. Thus wrote the Roman poet Virgil in the late first century BCE. He says, "O oh, farmers, happy beyond measure, could they but know their blessings for them, Far from the clashes of arms, the most righteous earth voluntarily pours forth easy sustenance from her soil. If they never gaze at doors inlaid with lovely tortoise shell or at draperies bedazzled with gold, they sleep free of anxiety, a life that is innocent and rich with untold treasures. Now, this image of the righteous rustic living in noble poverty was not limited to works of literature, as we see below on a wall painting from a private house from the environs of Rome. This distorted view of the countryside is very much a part of the elite and imperial agenda, which reflects the economic relationship of unbalance between the productive output of the countryside, much of whose land was owned by elite urban citizens and those who worked it. While it is true that the lived realities of the empire's rural inhabitants are almost invisible in elite works of art and literature, there is in fact an abundance of material evidence left behind by them, which is still preserved today. In the, the Roman province of Bithynia, which today is located in northwestern Turkey, rural settlements such as villages, estates, and isolated farmsteads dominated the landscape, with cities like Nikaya, modern Iznik, and Nicomedia, Izmit, located only intermittently between them, such that we might speak of these cities as islands among the countryside. Moreover, some 1,400 inscribed monuments from the countryside have been published thus far from Bithynia, which were set up by country dwellers, primarily for religious as well as funerary purposes, thus making the area an ideal case study for rural history at this period. The vast majority of these inscriptions from the countryside were tombstones. So in my limited time today, I will discuss some key findings from my research concerning those tombs. I argue that these mon monuments will show us, contrary to Witcher's claim, that rural societies represented themselves and their families with a whole range of identities. So of the nearly 1,200 tombstones attested from rural Bithynia in this period, we know that some 65 of them were decorated with scenes from agricultural life, such as yoked oxen, donkeys, pruning knives, and axes. Now, this number is likely artificially low, since stones have often become very weathered, either by nature or by frequent, frequent reuse in modern construction projects. There's probably many more that show these scenes than appear in the current publications. The most common rural image found in these tombstones was the pruning knife, the bill hook, called a drepanon in ancient Greek, which was the lingua franca of this area at the time. It appears in over half of those tombstones. The drepanon was a curved iron blade, which was used for pruning fruit trees as well as vines and removing dead branches, and also just landscaping the vines as you saw fit. The drepanon, as such, would have been a standard tool on Bithynian farms for regular maintenance and is still used by farmers in the region today. The tool was often carved in relief at the end of inscriptions for the dead, as in this tombstone in the shape of a column now in the Ballroom Museum. 
So according to the inscription, we learn that the man, he who possessed fame in civic affairs, business affairs, as well as in agricultural affairs, his venerable wife, Domna, set up the tombstone for the sake of his eternal memory and piety. Domna chose to remember her husband for three of his life's achievements, his success in affairs, civic affairs, so politics and administration, his business acumen um, and financial successes, as well as his good sense in farming and agricultural production. So given the first two achievements, one does wonder whether the reference to farming here concerns the deceased man actually doing the labor himself, or rather was an allusion to a workforce that he hired to do it on his behalf. And we can see here in this map that the relationship between the village where the stone was found and the ancient city um, was actually quite short, just 10 kilometers apart. So this man had at least, we can imagine, been to the city before and may well have been a landowner. However, in at least one example, the deceased is clearly depicted in the tombstone using the Drepanon uh, in real time. In this tombstone from a village in the territory of Bursa, we encounter a certain Agathocles holding a Drepanon in his right hand and using it to trim a, grape, trim a grapevine in his left hand. Now, a rather silly, but I think helpful comprehendum for this to understand exactly what Agathocles is shown doing here is this 13th century manuscript from Cambridge where we find a farmer in nearly the exact same pose. No paint analysis has been conducted yet on Agathocles' tomb. And it's worth considering that it also might have been adorned with color to help fill in some of the details of the scene. Also interesting for us is the garment in which Agathocles is wearing because it sheds light on his social status. He has on a long sleeve tunic, which comes down to his knees, as well as shoes with, which go above his ankles. We have several Bithynian parallels for the working man's tunic, which appear on other funerary reliefs. For example, in this early fourth century tombstone from Goliaca on the shores of Lake Iznik. In this case, we are lucky that the epitaph is particularly descriptive, revealing a little bit more about the status of the deceased. So he says, I, Aurelius Tryphon, the son of Secundus, with my brother-in-law, Aurelius Dionysius, and my sister, Haladios, set up this monument while we were still alive for our father Demetrius, who lived for 70 years. Good luck, traveler. And if anyone buries a stranger here, they shall give to the city 10,000 denarii. I, Aurelius Tryphon, honor my masters, who owned this land and gave the tomb to me. So as we learn, this tomb was set up by two siblings for their father, who had lived a long life at 70 years. What's interesting for us, though, is the final line, which states that Tryphon, quote, honored his masters who owned the land and thereby allowed him to construct a family tomb for his father and eventually himself on the estate. Thus, we can imagine that these individuals were likely tenant farmers who rented plots of land on some sort of large estate in the area on which the owner allowed them to build the tomb. In a similar way, we might imagine that Agathocles was also a tenant farmer. But these examples do not necessarily mean that the image of the Drepanon was never used by estate owners, the highest rungs of rural society. A limestone stele dated to the third century CE, found in the foothills east of the Yenishahir Plain, which is over 50 kilometers away from Bursa, the nearest city, was set up by a son to commemorate his father. The man was a deceased Praetorian soldier who had just retired, Lucius Valerius Potitus. Now, the Praetorian Guard was among the most prestigious positions in the Roman army, as they were responsible for protecting the person of the emperor himself. These men wielded increasing political power well into the Roman Empire, and on several occasions, they were actually responsible for overthrowing sitting emperors in favor of new challengers. The stele was decorated in relief with several objects, including a shield and a sword, two daggers, as well as a drepanon and a dolabara, which was a special, another specialized tool that was used for digging up old vine roots and creating new trenches for vineyards as well as um, fruit orchards. Given his elite status as a member of the Praetorian Guard, the editors of this stone assumed that Potitus must have lived in the ancient city of Prusa. However, the tombstone was found in the Aeneas Shahir Plain, more than a day's journey to that city in antiquity. So instead, it is much more likely that Potitus owned a large estate somewhere on the plain, and he was buried on or nearby the property when he died. The presence of both the Drepanon and the Dolabara makes it likely that his farm cultivated grapevines among other products since this tool was used for orchards as well as vineyards. 
In terms of Potitus' social status relative to the farmers thus far discussed, he was certainly an echelon above them, since achieving the position of Praetorian Guard was no small feat in the ancient world. And this makes this tombstone all the more interesting, since it uses one of the traditional steely types of the countryside with the combination of rural motifs alongside those of the Roman military. This shows us that agricultural symbols were not necessarily tied to social status, as they adorned the tombstones of an array of people with different social backgrounds. Another, new, <clears throat> another tombstone found in Inigo again further challenges the assumption that agricultural tools only adorned, adorned the memorials of the lowest rungs of rural society. This tomb commemorated a family of four, Gaius Marius Valens, Moria Prima, and their children, Rufus and Marcella. In addition to the drepanon carved at the bottom of the scene, which was the specialized tool for vineyards, there are three figures shown in relief wearing what's called a hemation. Now, in contrast to a tunic, which we saw before, the hemation was the typical clothing of an urban citizen and was a purposefully restrictive cloak, which reached down to one's ankles and wrapped tightly around one, one's arms. So a quick comparison between the tomb of Agathocles and this family shows the, the distinction in the, the clothing, I think, very clearly. Moreover, given the fact that their father, Gaius Marius Wallens, had all three aspects of a Roman name, we know that this family must have had Roman citizenship. This is comparatively rare in Bithynia in this period, as most people did not receive Roman citizenship until the early third century when it was universally applied to all inhabitants of the empire. So once again, this tells us that the seeming juxtaposition between rural and urban and low and high status um, do not necessarily consider the countryside to be as dismissive as the elite writings of Roman poets like Virgil might lead us to believe. Although the vast majority of tombstones with the drepanon were set up for men, the tool also appears on at least two women's graves. One of these women's tombs comes from Kiljilair, a village near today's Guinuk, where a large ancient village was located. Countless inscriptions and ancient stones can be seen around Kiljilair today, attesting to the size of the village and the wealth of its inhabitants. These finds most notably include at least eight ancient wine presses, as well as other inscriptions decorated with grapes and other agricultural scenes. According to this tombstone, we learn that it was set up for a woman called Aya, the daughter of Papias, the wife of Perseus, who was the son of Metrobius. Now, as we can see here, the upper left panel was adorned in relief with two ox heads and two wreaths separated by a basket. Below them, it's very weathered, but you can see it on the stone, are an additional few objects, including a mirror, a basket, the drepanon, a dolabra, and two other objects, which I could not figure out uh, exactly what they were supposed to represent. Now, at least one scholar has argued that these agricultural tools must have been placed on tombstones of women only to serve as metaphors for some sort of zealous work ethic, rather than any real involvement with the labors of agriculture, which in their view would have been considered taboo. However, this has rightly been called into question in recent years um, by several scholars who point out that women did in fact have many real duties in viticulture, such as the just budding of flowers in the spring, as well as with just general assistance in the harvest. This interpretation that Aya did play a role in the viticultural scene here is strengthened by the presence of other agricultural tool tools in her epitaph, such as the dolabra, which was that tool for digging up old vine roots, and the double oxen motif at the top. As far as the Bithynian evidence is concerned then, agricultural tools were also not intended to be gendered across rigid lines. This brings us to our final set of cases, oxen. Just as the pruning knife was essential for the vineyard and for orchard cultivation, oxen, oxen were crucial for cereal production. Plow oxen served the important role of loosening soil before the seeds were sown. This would have included various types of wheat, barley, sesame, pulses, such as lentils, and their manure would have also been used to enrich the soil. Oxen in gravestones were sometimes represented simply as two heads together, as we just saw in the case of Aya, or else depicted at full length, yoked and plowing a field, as in this tombstone, also from the hinterland of Corsa. Similar to Agathocles, who has shown pruning a vineyard with a drepanon, here we meet Maximus in the act of plowing his fields. The epitaph is short, but it makes clear that his wife and his children wanted to remember him for this aspect of his identity. In addition to their crucial role in cereal production, oxen were also used for wagon transportation, 
And this has continued to be a common practice for farmers across Turkey until into the 1950s in the form of the so-called uh, kanyi or ox cart. So in fact, this ox cart is depicted on at least one tombstone from Bithynia, and I suspect more, but it's quite small, so they're often easy to, to overlook. It's likely that this stone came from Geve in the territory of Nikaya. Now the town is located on the Pamukova plain and was like today, very fertile and productive for all types of produce in antiquity, including grapes, olives, wheat, and an array of other fruits and vegetables. In the surrounding area today, you can still see vineyards and olive groves across the region. Moreover, Geve is especially famous for its quince, um, which are exported across the country of Turkey. Now, the text of this inscription is very faded, so it's difficult to tell exactly who is buried here. Um, but from what remains, we learn that the tomb was set up by a wife for her husband. An ox cart, such as the one depicted here, would have been the primary means of transporting all of the goods we just mentioned to markets for sale. Representations of two oxen on funerary stelae then also served as symbols for cereal crop production, as well as the transportation of those goods and the produce. Also interesting for us is that this tombstone was adorned with other agricultural tools, as well as a different set of objects. These are the diptych and the stylus. So in antiquity, a diptych was a wax tablet on which a person would carve notes using a stylus as a writing instrument. Writing utensils such as diptychs and styluses adorned about 15 of the tombstones with agricultural, agricultural reliefs from Bithynia. One scho recent scholar has argued that these objects must have been intended by the uh, people who were buried to serve as symbols of their quote, leisure literacy, such that the deceased sought to present, protect, excuse me, project themselves as quote, an all around gentleman farmer, mimicking the erudite readers of the cities. However, diptychs were used for functional writing as opposed to scrolls on which literary works would have been written in ink. Thus, they would not have been intended to serve as objects for the deceased to posture some sort of imagined literacy and erudition, but much more likely for their actual and practical usage in record keeping and accounting on the farm. As I hope this brief presentation has shown, we can certainly say a lot about the identities and trends in self-representation of the country dollars of Bithynia and the Roman Empire. In the tombstones we've just seen, we have evaluated how agricultural motifs were used to decorate tombstones of a wide range of social actors, showing that farming and labor were not understood as mere symbols of rustic poverty as Virgil would lead us to believe. Yet, it is also important to note that there were many tombstones which were not adorned with these images from the countryside, showing us that agriculture was just one facet of rural life. In the end, the rural history of the Roman Emperor, the Roman Empire need not equal agricultural history. Although they were often oppressed by landowners, country dwellers had much to say about themselves and their families. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Deborah, for this wonderful, wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm sure our participants have lots of questions or comment comments, but let's save them uh, after Joshua will present his uh, work first. Yes, Joshua, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you. So let me uh, turn my screen here. Can everybody see that? You all set? Good. All right. Thank you. So first, I want to start by thanking the Sabancha Center uh, for Turkish studies for extending uh, me this generous fellowship, which allowed me to complete my dissertation amidst all the difficulties brought by uh, the pandemic. And at a time when material support in the humanities and social sciences is, is becoming harder and harder to find, the center's funding and broader mission have become more important than ever, especially to Columbia students. And I, I just wanna personally thank uh, professors uh, Shen and Chelik uh, who are here today and the rest of the center's staff um, whose vision and, and tireless work, much of which was behind the scenes um, has created uh, a flourishing center here at Columbia offering a wide array of, of lectures and conversations. Um, and I'm honored to be a part of today. I can't think of a, a better way to cap off the year than having uh, two extremely different presentations um, temporally, methodologically, and even geographically. And so that's, uh, it's been really wonderful. 
Um, so my talk today is, is entitled Millets, Minorities and Migrants, Rethinking Identity in the Late Ottoman and Post-Ottoman Levant. And it draws on my broader research project entitled Imagining Antioch, Sectarianism, Nationalism and Migration in Greek Orthodox Bilet Shem. And both the talk and the dissertation focus on the Antiochian Greek Orthodox Christian community, which I'll just uh, briefly introduce uh, for reference. Um, it's the largest Christian community in Syria today, the second largest Christian community in Lebanon, historically based in uh, the ancient city of Antioch, which is present day Antakya. Um, and uh, I, I have here in the um, in the slide, I sort of circled some of the larger uh, population centers uh, for Orthodox Christians. There's also a very large um, uh, diaspora population, particularly in the Americas. Um, and uh, so in, in my broader work, I consider how Antiochian Greek Orthodox Christians navigated tumultuous social, political, and economic change from 1860 to 1958. Rather than treating group identity as fixed, timeless, or given, I ask how group identities were formulated intellectually, articulated socially, produced politically, particularly during moments of disruption and transformation. Um, I follow a diverse cast of characters, uh, no pop quiz at the end, I promise, uh, but it includes clergy, intellectuals, merchants, migrants, journalists, poets, diplomats, and political activists uh, from capital cities to small towns, rural villages, and the diaspora who leveraged various forms of social and political capital to reimagine their community and its uh, position within a rapidly changing world of empires and nation states. I draw, on, I draw on a wealth of largely overlooked source material produced by Orthodox Christians themselves, including religious and secular newspapers, petitions, memoirs, personal correspondence, works of literature, um, and more. Um, if people are, are interested, I can speak a little bit further in the Q&A about how my work engages with scholarship on uh, sectarianism and nationalism in Lebanon and Syria. But for this talk, I wanted to present uh, just three brief arguments that my work makes that I think resonate more specifically within the field of Ottoman and Turkish studies. Um, so I'm going to present, I guess, three arguments or provocations, if you will. The first uh, dealing with Millet. Um, in 1453, uh, Sultan Mehmet II conquered a large swath of territory and found himself in charge of a large non-Muslim and non-Turkish population. Traditional accounts suggest that the Sultan consulted, uh, constituted three major non-Muslim communities as Milets, Jews, Armenians, and relevant to this talk, the Greeks or the Milet Irum. Uh, the Sultan would uh, recognize and approve of uh, ecclesial leaders, um, including the ecumenical Greek patriarch based in Istanbul, or they would say Constantinople, uh, who would then be given considerable autonomy to administer the affairs of their respective communities. In exchange, the religious leaders would ensure that their communities remained loyal Ottoman subjects. When Sultan Selim III con uh, first, excuse me, first conquered Egypt and the Levant in 1516 to 1517, uh, these general logics were extended to the Patriarch of uh, Antioch as well. Um, so you can see on the map here the the Antiochians who I'm going to be talking about are the the population in blue. Um, thus, the Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople was given authority, at least in theory, over all of the empire's Greek Orthodox Christians. I should mention that historians of the Ottoman Empire have complicated this picture a bit. And first, the millet system was not timeless and unchanging. Um, while the arrangement certainly existed in the 19th century, it's unclear how institutionalized it was in practice in earlier centuries. Um, second, recent work by uh, Hassan Cholak uh, has uncovered imperial uh, Berets that have shown um, that although the sublime port in Istanbul primarily dealt with uh, the ecumenical patriarch in Istanbul, um, the imperial center also dealt directly with patriarchs of, of Alexandria and Antioch. Even so, accounts of millet reforms, which began in earnest in the wake of Ottoman Tanzimat reforms in the mid-19th century, and the wake 
uh, of the uh, Hatsi Humayun decree of, of 1856 are often told from the perspective of the Ottoman center rather, from the Arab, rather than from the Arab peripheries. So turning my attention instead to the Antiochian Orthodox community in Ottoman Syria, I argue that members of Millet communities renegotiated their relationship to the Ottoman Empire in face of uh, Tanzimat reforms and in, in so doing reshaped the social and political fabric. This was perhaps most visibly on display in the summer of 1898 when throngs of Orthodox Christians in Damascus uh, flocked to the uh, large cathedral in the city's historic Umayyad, uh, near the city's historic uh, Umayyad mosque to demand the resignation of their patriarch. The Greek Orthodox patriarch of Antioch at that time was an ethnically Greek man named Spiridon. A Greek clergy had ruled over the Syrian community since 1724, uh, but the, the past several decades, wealthy Orthodox merchants, ambitious Arab priests, and increasingly the general population had grown tired of Greek leadership. Spiridon in particular was accused of being aloof, incompetent, and corrupt. After he granted a controversial divorce to uh, Dragoman, uh, priests stopped invoking the patriarch's name in the weekly liturgy, and crowds uh, in Damascus demanded he resign. Ultimately, they were successful. Ottoman governor Nazim Basha uh, announced that the synod would settle the matter. And after a bit of wrangling, the archbishops voted to de uh, depose Spiridon and elected Archbishop Miletius Dumani of Latakia as the new patriarch. He was the first Arab patriarch in over 170 years. While the limited scholarship on this dramatic episode frames it either as an early outburst of Arab nationalism or denying virtually any agency to Orthodox Christians themselves, the product of Russian imperial machinations. However, I argue that the Arabization of the Antiochian Orthodox Patriarch it was the result of a decades-long process to reimagine what it meant to be an, a modern Ottoman subject in a rapidly changing world, and what Orthodox subjects could expect from their community's leaders and from the Ottoman state. As an example, consider the Orthodox community in Aleppo. In October 1850, simmering resentment toward Christian communities whose merchant class had become increasingly prosperous as a result of connections with European empires exploded into sectarian violence. Rioters looted churches, destroyed homes, and, and injured several Christian residents. Shortly after, the Ottoman Wali uh, arrested hundreds and ordered all stolen property to be returned to Christian communities. The Ottoman state also set up a commission by which indiv individuals could file claims for indemnities. Unfortunately, the administrator was reportedly corrupt and left many without compensation for their losses for decades. Church records show that the Orthodox uh, Communal Council, or uh, Majlis and Mille, uh, reached out to a layman uh, pictured there on your screen named Dimitri Shahede, who worked for the Orthodox Patriarchate in Damascus, asking him for help in securing reparations from the Ottoman state. It's unclear how successful he was, uh, but letters from the Aleppo Orthodox community show that they were profoundly grateful to have someone take up their case after so many years. In a letter dated October 7, uh, 1877, religious and lay leaders of Aleppo's Orthodox community went so far as to ask the Ecumenical Patriarch in Istanbul and the Holy Synod of, of Antioch to elect Shahada as their Orthodox bishop. Patriarch refused on the grounds that he was not a member of the clergy. Um, the Aleppans were furious that their preferences were ignored. Um, while they were ultimately unsuccessful, this episode marked a, a significant shift in popular understandings of religious leadership. People were no longer content with aloof bishops from foreign lands who couldn't speak Arabic and seemed unable to advocate effectively for their flocks. While Aleppo would not have an Arab archbishop until 1902, several other localities, including Latakia, Hamma, Beirut, Homs and Tripoli did manage to elect Arab bishops uh, over a long period of time. 
Uh, reflecting new expectations for communal leadership, these bishops partnered with wealthy laity, mostly merchants and bankers, to provide a dizzying array of social services fit to meet the challenges of the modern world, particularly in areas where Orthodox Christians felt that Ottoman state investment was lacking. Sectarian social organizations included a general charitable or benevolent societies, societies to administer Orthodox schools for boys and girls, orphanages, uh, societies to ensure that the dead were buried uh, properly and according with uh, religious practice, the Orthodox, uh, organizations to assist Orthodox travelers, Sunday schools, literary societies, and more. Um, they began in Beirut uh, in 1868 and continued to proliferate throughout greater Syria, um, leading up to uh, Miletius's election in 1899 um, and continuing well into the 20th century. I argue ultimately that they reflect efforts by Orthodox Christians to recalibrate their relationship with the Ottoman Empire and form a distinct, a distinct sense of communalism and modern subjectivity while remaining loyal subjects and operating, generally speaking, within the Millet system. The next uh, argument or provo uh, provocation is, is on uh, the question of minorities. The fall of the Ottoman Empire at the end of World War I also brought an end to the Millet system I was just discussing. With it, the Patriarchate of Antioch fell under control of the French mandate of Syria and Lebanon. Um, although many ecclesiastical structures, communal organizations, and social expectations that emerged from the late Ottoman period persisted, colonial politics introduced a new form of political subjectivity to the region, namely the category of minority. As you can see from the map, the French High Commission divided the territory up into several different statelets in order to frustrate resistance efforts of anti-colonial nationalists, to reward political allies, particularly uh, the Maronite Catholics living in present-day Lebanon, um, and to position so-called minority religious communities against the demographically uh, dominant or, or numerically uh, dominant Sunni Muslim community of greater Syria. Although we speak of minorities almost instinctually today in Middle East studies and beyond, I join other historians in arguing that it is, in fact, a modern construction based on a particular understanding of populations and governmentality, rooted ultimately in European imperialism. Benjamin Thomas White, for example, explains that the term minority in Arabic, aqliya, was not commonly used prior to the French mandate, at least not in the sense that we understand it today. My work on the Orthodox community reveals that the question of whether to embrace or instrumentalize a minority identity was actually quite divisive. To be sure, this wasn't a mere pedantic or personal question. The post-war Middle East featured a burgeoning public sphere and what historian James Galvin has called the emergence of an age of mass politics. Western fact-finding groups like the American King Crane Commission and the new League of Nations Permanent Mandates Commission based in Geneva solicited the views of greater Syria's inhabitants who in turn sought to shape the political landscape by claiming to speak for groups of communities through delegations, petitions, and claims to religious and political authority. As French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu argued in a 1982 lecture at the Collège de France, uh, one of the goals of the symbolic structure a struggle, excuse me, is to change the mode of actual being by changing the way being is perceived, since perceived being is indeed a part of the whole truth of our being in the social world. In other words, by claiming, morphing, or rejecting minority as an identity, Orthodox Christians were effectively reformulating their social and political positionalities. For the sake of time, I'll just briefly highlight three ways um, that Orthodox uh, Christians dealt with the minority question during the interwar period. The first approach was to embrace a distinctly minority identity and call for explicit guarantees to protect the rights of minorities as such. An early example of this can be seen in a January 1919 petition sent by Archbishop Basilius uh, de Bas of Akka, um, which is in Northern Lebanon today, uh, to the great Western Entente powers, 
purportedly on behalf of 60,000 people in his diocese, which is an interesting claim uh, to make, but nonetheless one that he did. Um, the petition resembled a legal document titled Statut in French or Dessur in Arabic, which roughly means constitution or, or statute, um, with discrete articles that Basilius proposed as the basis of a Syrian federation. He also drew heavily on new international legal discourses, including notions of minority rights and remarkably the need for colonial tutelage. He went as far as to suggest that federal legislative and judicial bodies be comprised of equal numbers of Syrian nationalists and citizens of a foreign mandatory power. Uh, his justification for foreign rule echoed the logic that existed in European circles for quite some time and would soon be adopted formally by the League of Nations mandates system. First, he called for Syria's cantons uh, to be uh, governed in a way that would protect the rights of minorities. Um, that's a, a direct quote, protect the rights of minorities. Um, and while he did not express a preference for which foreign power would assume the role of Syria's protector, he nodded to France in calling for laws to be based on uh, liberté, égalité, and fraternité. Um, this, he argued, would help to avoid religious conflict. At the same time, French officials later reported um, that Basilius feared French rule uh, because he thought that Maronites might get preferential treatment. Um, but regardless, um, he still called for some form of, of foreign rule, um, saying that the transition to independence would have to be uh, gradual. Um, his position was articulated in the petition, the position more broadly to embrace the identity of minority was articulated most significantly in and around uh, the state of Latakia, which was comprised by the French of a majority of so-called minority populations, including Alouis, Ismailis, Orthodox Christians, um, and a small number of Sunni Muslims. Over the course of the mandate, thousands of Orthodox Christians living in what is called uh, Wadi al Masara, or the Valley of the Christians, petitioned the French in favor of maintaining their autonomous enclave um, that was designed for minorities like themselves. And they used this language repeatedly in both Arabic and, and French. Um, ironically, the French abolished the separate state of Latakia in 1936 as a concession to the Syrian national bloc, uh, thus making uh, its inhabitants minorities once again in, in the Syrian Federation. While it's beyond the scope of this talk, the legacies, I argue, of this minority enclave continue to shape the sectarian dynamics of Syria even today. The second approach uh, can be considered avoidance and is perhaps most clearly seen in the politics of influential Orthodox Christians in Lebanon, especially Beirut, uh, who worked to mollify a deep-seated rivalry between Orthodox and Catholic Christians in the Levant in order to recast Lebanon as a majority a uh, Christian state, or at least a state where there were as many Muslims as Christians, and thus avoid falling into the category of minority. This strategy arguably had its roots in the late Ottoman period, when prominent uh, community leaders in Beirut served together on councils um, that endeavored to craft an even balance between Muslims and Christian representatives. Uh, the Cross-Sectarian Beirut Reform Society, established in 1912, operated on a similar basis. It was led by a Sunni Muslim and an Orthodox Christian uh, working together. Elected delegates to that society were split evenly between Muslim and non-Muslim members. And while the, Refor the Beirut Reform Society was shut down by the Ottoman state in 1914, the French High Commission drew the borders of the new Republic of Lebanon around similar sectarian logics. Their goal was to grant a, a substantial amount of power to Maronite Catholics. Indeed, the French took repeated censuses, which strategically included diasporic populations, to legitimate their political visions, infamously stopping, however, in 1932, when it became clear uh, that the population uh, of Muslims and Christians was not likely 50-50 anymore. Some Orthodox Christians, as a result, leveraged political and social capital with other influential Christian communities to conceive of Lebanon as a largely Christian state, 
To give just one example, I'll share some of the rhetoric used by prominent Orthodox diplomat and politician uh, Charles Malik, uh, who praised the Maronite influence in Lebanon, uh, writing, it is correct to say, I think, that without Maronites, there would be no Lebanon as we know it today. Whereas some members of the other sectarian communities could conceive or have conceived of Lebanon as possibly merging into a larger political whole, the Maronite community is simply incapable of conceiving this. They believe that there must always be a Lebanon in which the Maronites and the Christians enjoy their full liberties, and this cannot be had, according to them, except in a free, independent, and sovereign Lebanon. Uh, like the strategy of embracing a minority identity, the desire to avoid being minorities here has continued to shape po the uh, Lebanese politics throughout the 20th century. The third and final approach to this minority question was to reject the category of minority altogether in favor of what one might call big tent nationalisms under which different religious identities could be sublimated or subsumed. One of the clearest and earliest articulations of this came from Yusuf al Khal, um, who was a Greek Orthodox convert to Protestantism uh, and an early member of the Syrian Social Nationalist Party, which was founded by a Greek Orthodox Christian man named Antun Sa'adde. In a 1937 editorial for the party's newspaper, Al Nahta, uh, Yusuf al Khal uh, wrote uh, about the myth of minorities, in which he argued that the term minorities had become, quote, an expression of colonial policy, unquote, uh, through which Britain and France were able to extend their influence in the region on specious grounds of protecting minorities. Such policies, he charged, were not only more about imperial power than genuine humanitarian concerns, but they were also demographically nonsensical. Despite France's stated goal of creating states and statelets that would allow for a religious minority, uh, excuse me, a religious majority in each, Christians in Lebanon, Alouis in the Alawi state of Latakia, Druze in the Druze state, Muslims in Damascus and Aleppo, there were still religious minorities in each French-drawn polity. And this was particularly the case in Greek Orthodox, for Greek Orthodox Christians, uh, who were minorities in all of these polities. Um, al Khal warned his readers that colonial politics will, quote, continue to successfully encircle the fate of our national lives as long as people continue to think in terms of religious minorities, unquote. He called on people to embrace the idea, and I've got the uh, quote there for you, uh, that, that the Syrian nation is one social body with no mi uh, minority or majority national ties supersede religious, racial, and sectarian ties." Unquote. The only way to blunt colonial influence, according to him, was to reframe discursive social categories in the Levant that had de uh, developed in the post-Ottoman uh, era. I would also note that anti-minority rhetoric became a staple of the Ba'ath Party in Syria and Iraq, which was also co-founded by a Greek Orthodox Christian. In short, by treating minorities not as a timeless ontological reality, but as politically produced discursive categories, uh, we can better understand the sectarian politics of the region and by extension, allow us to recognize that tensions between different religious communities or attacks against uh, minority populations are not the result of timeless hatreds, but rather the result of the politicization of religion and religious communities in the region. Finally, um, and I'll be brief here, um, but my research has increasingly turned to studies of migration and mobility, in part because so many Orthodox Christians moved within and without Ottoman Syria, and their experiences of migration shaped communal identity. For the sake of time, I'll note just two very brief examples. First, many Orthodox Christians live, living in diaspora engaged in political activism, sending petitions, publishing newspapers, fundraising for charitable causes, and as historian uh, uh, Stacey Fahrenholt has recently shown, even helping to recruit uh, for allied armies during the First World War. Much of this included articulating visions about what the post-war Middle East ought to look like. Naturally, migrants were shaped by different social and political contexts um, in their host countries. In my dissertation, for example, I show how Antun Sa'adde, founder of the Syrian Social Nationalist Party, was influenced by political changes he witnessed firsthand in Brazil, where he lived from 1921 to 1930, um, 
and in Argentina, where he lived from 1938 to 1947. Specifically, I argue that he took inspiration from Getulio Vargas, who came to power in Brazil in the 1930 coup, um, and the populist from authoritarian model of Juan Domingo Perón, uh, who came to power in Argentina in the mid-1940s. Second, the Orthodox community was also shaped by experiences of forced migration, resulting from moments of sectarian violence and relevant to Turkish studies, diplomatic negotiations between France and the early Turkish Republic over uh, what the Syrians would have called the Sanjak of Alexandretta, what the Turks called uh, the Hatay province, beginning uh, with the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923. This treaty largely, although not entirely, settled the borders of the Turkish Republic and imposed a new citizenship regime on inhabitants of Bilad Shem, who had previously been considered simply Ottomans. This not only affected people still living in the region, but it also changed the legal citizenship status of hundreds of thousands of erstwhile Ottoman Syrians in diaspora, who suddenly, overnight, became Syrians and Lebanese. If people are interested, I can talk a little bit more about the Syro-Lebanese uh, diaspora and how they dealt with this in the Q&A. Suffice it to say, some embraced the new designations, others resisted them, and still others played around with hybrid nationalisms. Uh, perhaps more dramatically, the Treaty of Lausanne also posed new thorny questions for Antiochians living in historic Antioch. Their identities as Christians and Arabic speakers took on new valence and remained unsettled until 1939. After a complex process that included extensive diplomatic negotiations and a contentious referendum campaign, which you can read more about in Sarah Shields' excellent work, uh, Fezes and the River, uh, thousands of Antiochian Orthodox Christians left, preferring to settle in cities like Aleppo and Beirut rather than live in a Turkish Republic relying oftentimes on family connections or orthodox charitable organizations to integrate themselves into the still nascent states of Syria and Lebanon. The loss of historic Antioch remained a point of contention for Syrian and Arab nationalists alike for many years after the fact. Uh, beyond disruptions resulting from the Treaty of Lausanne and subsequent negotiations over the Hatzai province, I've also begun to consider how the resettlement of displaced peoples after episodes of sectarian violence, such as the 1860 civil war in Mount Lebanon and Damascus, as well as violence during the Great Syrian Revolt of 1925 to 1927, shaped communal identity and views about whether and how coexistence could be possible. It has become clear to me that one cannot fully understand the production and reproduction of identity in the modern Middle East without considering how mobility, broadly defined, shaped social and political realities in the region. So just uh, conclude then, um, in keeping with my pattern of alliteration, uh, I'll offer you a fourth M that in many ways sums up my current project and broader research uh, proclivities, namely uh, margins. In many ways, the Antiochian Orthodox Christian community has found itself in a marginal position both within the sectarian political frameworks of modern Syria and Lebanon and within the scholarly literature on the modern Middle East. However, my work uncovers a vibrant community that discussed, debated, and formulated their own subjectivities in the face of changing social, political, and economic structures. Whatever can be said, about the political position of particular groups or political communities in the modern Middle East today, marginalization was not, and I have to believe is not inevitable. Turning our attention to the modern to the margins of historical and social inquiry broadly defined, one is confronted with new questions and must rely on often overlooked sources. Such inquiries can be difficult and have its limitations, um, but they can also invite the construction of different narratives and promise fresh insights into the field of Ottoman and Turkish studies. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joshua, for um, your fabulous presentation. Um, what we have here is an extremely rich and diverse body of scholarship, and I think this richness and diversity accords well with the mission of our Sakab Sabanja Center for Turkish Studies, because we try to promote research and events uh, related to the histories, societies, and cultures of Turkey and the surrounding region. So I'm extremely grateful for your excellent scholarship.
uh, partially undertaken under uh, Zakos Sabancı Center for Turkish Studies. So the floor is open for uh, questions and comments. So if you have anything to ask, please raise your virtual hand or um, real hand, and then I'll give the floor to you. Um, let me just start by asking a question to Deborah. Uh, how well preserved are these monuments and the graveyards? Uh, I mean, you showed us uh, an extremely interesting sample of tombstones, but I really want to hear more about your overall research experience in Turkey. Can you say a little bit on that? Yeah, so of course, as I mentioned, there are some that tombstones that have been damaged over time just through reuse and these sorts of things, but there's ongoing epigraphic, basically publication efforts that uh, some scholars are just traveling across the countryside asking different villages if they have ancient tombstones in their graveyards. And what's very interesting is most of these, in, these Roman period tombstones come from the the graveyards that have been used in the Ottoman period, in the modern period. So it's just a continuation of use um, and they're very well preserved. Uh, the, I would say the majority of them are well preserved in that, in that sense, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Giuliana Bertoni uh, has something to ask, yes. Hi, Debbie, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you like, I like I'm seeing you like breaking the stereotype, the Roman stereotypes of Roman um, um, rural uh, world, and I wonder, like in your in your research, like what is what surprised you most about rural Bithynia? That's a great question. Thanks for that, Julia. Um, I think what surprised me most is you know something that I kind of alluded to throughout the the presentation, which is that rural life isn't just about farming, right? Isn't just about laboring and having a miserable uh, experience of things. You know, there's, an there's a, a wide range just in the funerary evidence alone of different identities, naming practices, decorative motifs that people use, things that people talk about that mention in the inscription and in the epitaph that, that don't really line up with these images that a lot of scholars take at face values that you find in these elite Roman authors that say that, you know, all people that live in the countryside are these simple, happy people, but it's also because they live in happy poverty. That it's very clearly not the case. Um, in Bithynia, especially because most people are living in the countryside, so they're actually quite wealthy um, and not these, you know, indentured uh, farmers, but I would suspect in the rest of the, the Roman empire as well too. Um, Nadir? Um, hi, I just want to thank you both for your um, presentations. Uh, it's really impressive to see the product of uh, years of research and uh, gives hope to us all that we will also get there. Um, my question is for Josh. Um, I was wondering when I was listening to the first portion of your presentation, um, I was wondering, so, like in the late Ottoman era, there's a lot of talk about Ottomanist notions of citizenship and um, you know and sometimes granted that has a very that has more of an Islamic flavor but I was wondering if um, in your research you found any members of the orthodox community kind of advocating for something like that to, to like transcend the millet and you know like have their relationship to the Ottoman state not be mediated by religion because you know as you show in the second part of your presentation that's a very prominent feature of, of Orthodox politics. So I was wondering if that like, um, uh, you know, it can be extended backward to the Ottoman, late Ottoman era as well, or if it's just uh, not something you saw. Thanks. Well, um, yeah, thanks for the question. It's, um, it's a good one. There are certainly in, in the very, very late Ottoman period when you have, uh, you know, folks like uh, Farah Antun and, and people, you know, espousing, um, you know, an almost anti-clerical uh, form of secularism, then yes, you, you definitely see a desire to reconstitute uh, citizenship on a, a different basis. But I think uh, practically speaking, 
the what what you're talking about was was uh, brought through Arabization. So it was this notion that um, you know we don't necessarily need to transcend uh, the millet system, but it has to change, right? That the the millet system has to be something um, where people actually on, are you know from uh, Greater Syria specifically, rather than being born in Anatolia or being born in Greece. Um, and and the qualifications that people began looking for um, were, you know, were empathy, people who could speak Arabic, and people who would engage in in these sorts of partnerships with um, with other uh, communities. So I think things were still um, generally through a, a fairly sectarian lens. Perhaps the the only um, area on which that would be tested a little bit would be missionary education, um, where there were a number of Orthodox Christians who would send their kids um, to uh, certainly Protestant, uh, but also Catholic institutions. Um, but even there, there was often a desire to or a preference to have an Orthodox school as long as it was going to be a good Orthodox school. Right. And, you know, and heck, they'd even take a, an Ottoman state school if there was going to be one. But in a lot of uh, rural areas, where it, you know there simply were no state schools, um, people just wanted something done, and they wanted uh, the millet structure to work for them in the context of uh, of a, a broader modern Ottoman Empire. Howard Spandlow. Uh, quick question for Josh: a, a broad three-part question on sources. Um, what was the greatest difficulty you had in finding sources for your material? Was there anything that you uncovered by serendipitously that really pushed things forward? And was there any way you had to revise your hypotheses as you went along as the sources dictated? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so one of the difficulties that I've found, I was able to uh, have access to sources from the, the church itself, the, the patriarchate, um, but they stopped abruptly in 1920 because the rest of the sources post-1920 are uncatalogued um, and in Damascus. Um, so so I, I definitely did have to take a very eclectic approach to sources. Um, I think one of the most serendipitous discoveries um, that I made was uh, finding petitions often um, in, in French archives that were sent by Orthodox Christians themselves. And, you know, just taking a moment and reading what those petitions had to say. And I, I think there was a tendency early, early on um, to reproduce the community um, as a coherent community, right, and, and to really try, you know, almost Max Weber style to, to get a, a spirit of the orthodox and, and to impose the kind of homogeneity that often is, is imposed. And I really just had to let that go. And I had to understand that at the same time, it doesn't mean that orthodox identity was completely irrelevant, because when you look at a petition and it's signed by you know, 500 rural Orthodox villagers all making the same kind of demand, that has to come about through some form of political organizing. Some, someone went around, you know, and collected all of those signatures and pushed a particular case, a particular notion of identity. And so, so that was that was what I've I've had to revise. It's it's to to accept the the messiness. Um, even even as historians, we often try to impose order on all the details and the messiness to sometimes understand that that there is not as much order as we might like to think. Um, but to to really just go as much as I can with the sources and to pull from anywhere I could possibly find to stitch together a coherent narrative that was still um, sort of faithful to what I was seeing. Uh, and Hussein Kurt has a question. Hi, Joshua. I'd like to ask you uh, about the uh, uh, capitalist dynamics in, in, uh, in this highly uh, complex uh, picture of the interplay between identity, migration, uh, liberal order, uh, quote, so-called liberal uh, Ottomanist uh, order, and the uh, intervention of the uh, European empires uh, uh, 
you know, into this uh, uh, real political game. So I wonder whether there were any uh, role of uh, capitalist forces interested in these displaced, uh, you know, people uh, moved into new areas without any land, any, you know, uh, uh, social uh, or, uh, you know, uh, political uh, capital and uh, have to work uh, for, you know, uh, have to work uh, and earn their uh, wages uh, at a factory or in a commercial agricultural sector. So I remember Issa Blume's argument about the uh, late Ottoman Balkans and the uh, interplay between the capitalist forces in a commercial ag agriculture or infrastructural investments and the use of cheap, uh, you know, uh, labor by the opportunities uh, arise out of these uh, migrations, uh, displaced people. So have you, you know, uh, noticed any similar pattern going on in, in the uh, Mediterranean in the 20th century in terms of this uh, ecumenical uh, game, so to speak? It's a, it's a great question. Uh, um, um, yeah. oh, is, my question is my question clear? I could, yeah, you know. absolutely, absolutely, and it's a, it's an excellent point. Um, I um, so I, I think regarding uh, displacement specifically, you see this most often. Um, so a lot of the Orthodox elite tended to be um, not industrialists per se, but they tended to be merchants, and so they had a lot of money. Um, and one of the things I noticed um, is that there was an interplay. Um, between it was it was a way that that laity could assert uh, more influence in the community was by providing not so much labor per se, um, but by providing the, these sort of charitable organizations that people would come to depend on. Um, and one of the things that I um, was really struck by um, was that. Uh, a lot of these charitable organizations started, uh, as I mentioned, in Beirut in the, the late 1860s. That was after um, a number of Orthodox Christians came from uh, villages like, uh, or small towns like Hasbaya and Roshaya in what is now southeastern Lebanon, as a result of that 1860 civil war. So there was a, a push, and, and essentially all these internally, what we would call internally displaced people today, settling in Beirut contributing to this large uh, urbanization uh, of Beirut and, and a significant expansion of, of the city. I and mean, people forget Beirut used to be just a, a tiny little port village um, in the early 19th century. It, it grew to be something much larger. And in that process of urbanization and resettling populations, uh, wealthy families, uh, it, it, people uh, know the history of Lebanon, uh, families like the Sursuk Trads and, and the Sutruses and Twainis and, and many others um, saw this as an opportunity, you know, that if we take care of our own and stake a claim that we are taking care of our Orthodox Christians, um, then it was a way that they could get greater influence um, certainly vis-a-vis -vis the Greek elements, um, you know, they were able to make arguments that we we're taking care of people in a way that, you know, the Greeks are not and are not able to. Um, and it also provided a little bit of agency as well. I mean, a lot of these organizations did in fact rely on donations from Imperial Russia. It's absolutely true. And state, Ottoman state investment was, was there as well. But having uh, capital that came from European merchant connections um, also fueled uh, the production of, of these social organizations, which I argue also shaped uh, communal identity at that uh, time. There are other examples, but that's the one that immediately came to mind. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have a little bit of more time for questions or comments. Uh, if any of our presenters has anything to add, feel free to use this time. Otherwise, I'm just going to thank Joshua and Deborah um, for sharing their really exciting research with us. As I said in the beginning, this panel is the final event of uh, uh, the academic year.
Um, and I mean, these events couldn't have been possible without the tremendous effort and the guidance of Professor Zeynep Celik, who is with us today, but unfortunately, uh, she had to stay a bit silent due to uh, an ongoing medical situation. Uh, well, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Celik for everything she's done um, over the course of the year. Um, but please stay tuned for more events uh, that will start in early fall. Uh, that we will be uh, organizing um, as part of the Sakip Sabancı Center for Turkish Studies, you know, year-long events. Um, so uh, we are wishing you all a pleasant summer, um, and thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks so much.